everybody? Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Okay, um, so um, welcome to the serverless session, so on the cloud track. Um, I'm happy to see, uh, well, actually more people than I expected, because uh, typically what is the serverless is somehow, somehow unknown to Riga. Right. It's um, um, on more thematic uh, sessions like for cloud computing and so on. It's a quite uh, um, quite popular topic uh, this year, but uh, in Riga, I, tip I uh, always had one question. What is the serverless architecture? Right. So uh, today um, I'm going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to explain what is serverless architecture. And uh, for those who already know what it is, I will try to explain what not to do with the serverless architecture, right? So, uh, but first of all, a uh, little bit about myself. So, um, yeah, actually, um, yesterday during the keynote, uh, somebody placed um, a picture of me and uh, yeah, until until actually yesterday morning, I wasn't sure that I will be able to walk. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, after running marathon this uh, Sunday, um, that was my first marathon this uh, season, so it was quite tough. But okay, it's okay, I survived it, and uh, I I can even w w walk right now. But uh, um, let me tell about myself. So I am. Um, I am actually a full stack developer who writes code uh, on a daily basis. Um, I work for a company called uh, uh, Agile Stacks uh, in position of director of engineering. And, uh, and yeah, actually um, we, uh, we were uh, someone who have used uh, uh, serverless architecture on the daily basis as the primary, so is the primary architecture for the cloud solutions, and uh, yeah, probably more than for uh, for a year. Um, I started use it, use serverless architecture uh, for my previous uh, uh, company where I have worked in. That was a quite a big consulting company, um, but and then when we moved uh, to the new company. Um, then we um, try to adopt some of the right ideas, and uh, actually, yeah, I will uh, spoil the end of the presentation. So uh, a few weeks ago, we stopped using serverless. Um, I was the guy who um, who promoted serverless for in our company, and I was the guy who killed it. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say it's it's actually bad. I I would say it did not fit to our use case, and uh, I will speak more about the use cases um, during during this presentation. So um, first of all, let's start. And uh, you know, um, first thing that we learn in the cloud is actually you're going to pay for everything, literally for everything. For and uh, what's most important, you're going to pay for all your mistakes that, that you do. And uh, actually, um, and this is why the economy, uh, the cloud economy, I guess, uh, the best uh, driver for all your design decisions. So uh, before you want to adopt this or, or that approach, you need to consult how much it, it's going to cost you. Uh, thankfully, uh, cloud computing provides a very nice um, model where you can somehow predict how, uh, how much uh, this decision is going to cost you, and if uh, it's going to be too much or you anticipate it uh, somehow slow, you still have a quite a good possibility to migrate to something else, right? So um, actually, uh, if you look at the, um, I'm here I'm referencing to the big data group, um, quite uh, not so recent uh, research that have done over 250 companies uh, around the world. Um, uh, they actually questioning them 
about cloud economy, how do they use uh, cloud. So in, in, below, in below you can see the link. Uh, you can check, uh, you can check uh, more uh, data um, by yourself, but uh, most interesting, I just place it here for your convenience. So um, about 64% uh, uh, of the cloud expense is going to EC2 instances, which are, which are literally VMs. Um, actually, um, you also will take a look that the, the users are trying to minimize, uh, um, uh, trying to maximize uh, the efficiency of how they use the instances. So they're trying to minimize its size. So they believe that uh, the size uh, that um, uh, if they choose the smaller instances for their microservices is going to be better. Um, well, um, let's see. Uh, and we see that uh, the even small size instances are utilized for 16%. Right? The rest, the rest, they are kind of idle and uh, they are not used. You can also see that uh, other sizes are uh, also not utilized. So um, this makes me think, what? Um, when I want to use cloud, I only want to pay for <laughs> what I really use. I uh, want to pay for what I really need. And I don't want to pay for idle things that I, nobody is using, right? Um, if you go to the Amazon, they will ask you, oh, that's very simple. So uh, there are reserved instances for you. Just apply for three years plan uh, in advance and, and you will get uh, enough VMs to use with a significant discount. But um, typically, uh, many people are not using it because uh, they're kind of not comfortable to, up, uh, to upfront plan of using, uh, of using this or that instances. And it can be even worse. It's like the fear of commitment. It's like you need to kind of uh, guess right that uh, the size of the VMs that you have chosen is actually right. If it's wrong, then you will be damn wrong uh, for the next three years. Uh, so uh, this is why uh, many people are, are not using reserved instances. So uh, what to do? And uh, today, um, and today I will speak about something that uh, s people often called FAS, Function as a Service, and uh, which is the basement for serverless architecture. And uh, we will go through the, some good and bad code. And um, I will explain, I will show some serverless blueprints uh, that we have tried, yeah. And a uh, few of them were good, but uh, nevertheless, they can give you significant uh, savings um, over, um, over traditional VMs, right? So um, actually, uh, for those who never heard about serverless architecture, so there are some servers, so don't worry. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, they are not given to you for the management. They will be managed by the cloud provider themselves. Instead, they will give you a container but not container itself, but um, an ability to take your code, upload to the container, and they will run it. And uh, they will charge you only for execution. And uh, the price for execution is quite okay, right? But that's not uh, all. Uh, serverless architecture, the most precise definition of serverless architecture, I'm gonna give you just uh, right away. This. So serverless architecture uh, implies a lot of services that can be an event sources for this uh, for these containers that are running your code. It can be um, it can be Internet of Things. It can be messages, uh, including uh, API gateway or SNS queues and topics. Uh, it can be streams or some application development or, or uh, um, management services, something like uh, events uh, from the CloudWatch uh, alarms or other notifications. So uh, this, uh, 
what will happen, all these resources will create uh, an event that your, um, that Lambda service will, will react on it. And what will happen uh, is the following. So once the event has been triggered, then the new container will be created. And this container will be um, something that uh, cloud provider provisions for you uh, that already has the runtime the application runtime with the desired, uh, with some of the desired software. Um, the, uh, and then it will provision it for you in less than a second. And uh, here you can execute the code and as a result, you'll produce an another event that will be triggered uh, by uh, some other service and so on, right? And uh, basically the serverless, when you take, when there is uh, initial event coming, either from the user or from the service, then you react on it, you do something, and you generate the next event, and then next event, and so on. So, uh, beauty of this is actually the price. That's uh, probably the main motivation for use. So, uh, here is the small comparison between the VMs and uh, here I have chosen T2 small VM, which is uh, more or less equal uh, VM to the containers that will Amazon give to you, will give to you. So um, actually um, what we see is that uh, the VMs are priced per hour. And, uh, and uh, while the Lambda has been priced for millions of executions. Um, for Lambda container, you can choose a uh, number of RAM that you're going to give to it. And it's actually, um, and then uh, based on, on the RAM consumption, you will pay more or less. And that's basically it, right? It's a super easy formula to calculate uh, what you need and uh, you can project how much executions uh, you can use. So um, here is one slight problem. The Lambda function is the stateless. You cannot write to any file. You cannot use any storage at all. You just take the message, you do something and produce another message. And uh, if you still need to save some data, sometimes you do. So you put it into the temp directory and you have uh, a half of gigabyte ephemeral storage. Ephemeral storage, that means that uh, if cont when container will be disposed, all your storage will be disposed as well. Um, and most important uh, limitation is actually timeout for uh, Lambda, which is uh, five minutes. It's a hard limit that you cannot extend. If you need more, if you need more to execute a small piece of your code than five minutes, then probably either something wrong with your code or you need different service. Um, yeah, and uh, for streaming services, if you want to stream some data, actually make sure that uh, uh, your um, stream batch that you send to Lambda function is less than uh, six megabytes. Otherwise, uh, you will get an error. So, um, Lambda supports um, uh, several application runtimes, and uh, Node.js and uh, Node.js. Yes, finally, Node.js 6. Oh, yes, Node.js 7 came and Node.js 6 is now finally supported. Yes, and uh, Python 2, Python 3, uh, Java, of course. Um, the only thing that I never t uh, tried is to use Microsoft-ish uh, uh, containers. They are slightly different, but uh, I will not, and because I did not try it, uh, C Sharp or AGS, I will not use it. Uh, I will not. Uh, tell about my experience of using it. So, but that's not the least. Um, after you have chosen the um, runtime for your Lambda function, and for different Lambda function can be different runtime, uh, then you need actually to think about a bunch of other stuff like configuration management, uh, secret management, uh, how, how you are going to discover the services and dependencies, actually how do you uh, handle the authentication authorization and the private, private uh, VPC access and so on and so on. Many other things that uh, are coming uh, together as the, some kind of headache for you as, as the designer. So, but uh, before we start to think about this, let's uh, think about most, uh, to my 
believe uh, biggest uh, limitations of uh, um, of lambda. It's it's actually latency. So uh, during the last year, Amazon had done several updates uh, to the lambda uh, to the lambda um, infrastructure, and they have done marvelous. Um, improvements of on the performance but still few things you need to uh, you need to con consider so this data is actually up to date uh, I was uh, entertaining myself uh, uh, during this whole morning by trying to put benchmark on the latest uh, latest uh, update that uh, have been done uh, a few days ago and actually, this is the latest data that you can experience. So you see that uh, there is a big gap between the first execution and the sequential execution of the container. And this happens because uh, when the first event uh, comes, then the hypervisor thinks, oh, this looks like event that uh, some of my Lambda functions have been subscribed. And now it uh, provisions a new container. When new container has been provisioned, it, um, it, uh, it, it takes this, actually it's um, Amazon Linux, which is uh, CentOS, um, and uh, mounts uh, your code as the directory and runs it, right? And to, to do this, um, for many containers, it takes approximately 30, around 30 seconds. 30 milliseconds, which is, uh, you would say it's, uh, oh, it's super fast, right? But uh, think about this differently. Um, many of Lambda executions are actually not, not the only one Lambda execution. Uh, often I can see that people are chaining them, like one Lambda after next Lambda after next Lambda, and then you will get this uh, statistical fluctuation between the Lambda executions, and by chaining three Lambdas, you can easily get one second of delay. And uh, sometimes, uh, and sometimes even more. Um, next, uh, next thing, uh, wha what is important? This, this actually starts for Hello World Lambda. So this is the fastest you can get. Everything else will be slower, especially if you do any AP API call uh, or you or you interact with any resource outside of Lambda. It will be much slower. So uh, think about this uh, when you consider of moving certain services to the Lambda. Um, second thing, which is, uh, use, uh, which is interesting. So um, Amazon have done a lot of optimizations uh, for Java containers, and Java now finally runs uh, quite okay, I would say. And uh, however, they have done some magic for the new generation of the containers, uh, which corresponds to the Node.js 6 and Python 3. I don't know what they do, but they are damn fast. And especially for uh, Node.js and uh, often for Python, I, it's like uh, you cannot get this experience. It's like it's, it, it, it has such feeling that containers is always running. Um, yeah, I cannot, uh, I cannot explain it uh, because uh, as Amazon doing, they, um, when they spin up a new container, they keep it alive for uh, five minutes. And then after five minutes, they will dispose it because uh, they want to utilize uh, this, uh, uh, their capacity for some other, uh, somebody else lambdas. So, but for Python and for Node.js, it's, um, I don't know what they do. So um, I tried a little bit uh, to move, uh, to show what is Lambda, for those who never seen it. So, and uh, because I didn't knew which language is your, your favorite one, I have chosen uh, among three of my favorites. It's Java, uh, Node.js, and Python. So the, actually the Lambda, if you look, it's, a, it's a just a small method, and that's it. So, um, so basically, what happens? It's uh, I will. It's better to explain it the Java class. So, when the new container is up and running, then your application will automatically boot. Then, hypervisor will call only the method, right? And then for the, uh, for the next execution, uh, it will call only method. 
because all objects are in the memory. So this automatically means that if you want something to be cached between the executions, something like a database connection, you probably will want to put it outside of the method. Right? And then it will be cached. So, um, but uh, for Java, uh, I Java is actually the only one runtime which requires some runtime dependencies. Uh, because uh, there are two things which are most important for Lambda is actually is uh, is um, is actually event that is coming to the function and the context. The event is uh, event can be anything. It is uh, as long as it is JSON encoded. Amazon only transfers JSON, and. Uh, and uh, from this event, your Lambda will actually understand what, uh, what it needs to do. And that's the right strategy for you. So you take the uh, event, you extract the payload, and you start to read, and you understand what you need to do, and you do. And then you produce an another one payload in the result. But um, there is also context that uh, can help you to make the decisions. The context uh, can give you some information, something like how much memory you still have available, or how much uh, milliseconds you still have uh, until timeout, and some other and some other things that uh, could be useful. For example, uh, for uh, Java runtime, you can have um, you can have logger. Right. For Python, you need to extract logger from uh, uh, from some other uh, from s some other events and so on. And the and the same goes for Node.js. You should just use console log. Yeah. Um, what do we do next? We deploy the code. So uh, how does it happen? You take the lambda, and then when you push the code, then the version one has been created. And automatically it, will, uh, automatically, it will be created a tag called latest. It's not the only one tag that you can do, but uh, uh, once you see, once you push the next version, uh, you can uh, publish it so uh, the latest will be shifted to the next uh, version, and so on. Or if you deploy version 4, you decide, oh, something went wrong with our uh, CI system, so it's, uh, it started to complain. Uh, instead of rolling back the code, you're just not putting the latest uh, tag to this. And, uh, this and, uh, and then all the integrations that know this, uh, that will execute Lambda, they will know that they must execute latest or maybe stable version. That can be the same or can be different. Right? And this is how you can link your environments to the Lambda uh, functions. Uh, because uh, without the servers, we don't have environments like environments, like the servers, so we just need to link uh, all uh, third-party integrations uh, to the, uh, to the uh, aliases of the exact version of the Lambda function. And that's it. So um, a few things that we learned uh, during the last year. Uh, first of all, when you plan your deployment, you need to split, uh, split your script into two parts. Um, one is responsible for initial deployment, because Lambda does not live in the vacuum. It, it, it has and should interact with some other resources like database, network addresses, uh, and so on. So you must deploy everything at once. Uh, for that, uh, use CloudFormation or Terraform. Uh, we prefer to use Terraform, but uh, many other people are using CloudFormation as the default service for from Amazon. So uh, what it does, it, it will provision not only Lambda, it will provision all other resources. Then it will use um, uh, environment variables to deliver uh, configuration of these resources in, inside of the Lambda. The only thing that be careful with the passwords, it, it must be encrypted. Don't, do not distribute it as is, right? And, uh, and then, for the sequential development or, uh, or uh, deployment for your, uh, for your increments of, of the CI, CD builds, or for your, uh, to support your normal development process, you, you, uh, we use uh, CLI, just Amazon CLI, and, and then we just execute update function code, and that's it. 
So uh, with this with this code, uh, it will just redeploy the code in the Lambda. It will create a new version, but it will not change all this all other configuration management details. So that's it. Uh, next thing is oh, let me switch a little bit to the qu quick demo. Um, okay. Okay, that's me. Not, not interesting. Yeah, so uh, here I have uh, deployed uh, some Lambda functions. And um, I have one Lambda function. Uh, it's written in Python. I just love this language. And it's quite self-explanatory. Um, what, it, what it does is actually I have a file with the facts about uh, Chuck Norris that it reads the file and then it's actually um, uh, takes the random uh, line from the f from the file and, and returns back. So um, first thing for my execution that I will do, um, I already wrote the code, and here in the configuration man management you see I have this random fact which is uh, method. So what I do, I uh, here I have the I have the handler which is which is actually method name. Right? And main main is actually main pi is our is my class. I use the um, Python runtime is uh, 3.6. Um, and uh, yeah, I can specify some more parameters. I can give more RAM if I want. Um, I can specify that uh, letter Q for notifications. Um, I can connect my Lambda function to the VPN to, uh, so it could access some private cloud resources or VPC, some private cloud resources like databases. And um, I can do some other stuff, including I can define uh, um, an encryption for, um, uh, for my secrets. So, but I'm, I'm not gonna do all this stuff, I'll just um, run the test execution. What will happen? It will. It says uh, it. It's read the file and produces the result. What also you can see that um, what's happened? It says that oh, the duration time is uh, 34 milliseconds, and you pay and you always pay with a step 100 milliseconds. That's the execution time, right? Um, and then uh, it says some other stuff, and actually I. I I gave it uh, the minimum amount of memory, and this is how much memory it consumed. Right? All these uh, stats uh, are important, uh, actually, to um, to tweak your lambdas because uh, uh, you remember uh, from the economy uh, of the lambda functions, you will pay for memory consumption. You are not paying for CPU consumption. So load as much CPU as you can, unload as much memory as you can. Um, if you need more, you can always uh, you can plug in the um, CloudWatch monitoring, and here you will see the events. Actually, this is the execution. What happened? Uh, the last execution, and I see the the same uh, the same result here, right? So um, yeah, and this is my uh, and this is my message, uh, my test message that I uh, that I sent uh, to my Lambda function. So, uh, what next I will do, it's uh, if I press this button inside of the Amazon, it's pretty much useless. So, I, I need to expose it to the, um, to the internet, right? To do this, uh, I must do the following. Um, I will select the trigger. Oh, I already, I already have one trigger. Okay, um, how about I will add another one. So, that's, um, that's the beauty because Lambda can have multiple triggers and this is exactly what you will do. And I'm gonna have an API gateway. Let me create uh, something new. Let's say like, um, hello, uh, Riga Dev Days. I will have this API gateway. The only thing that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have it opened. Uh, right, so okay. It says the warning, blah, 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 blah. Oh, that's... Uh, that's kind of, uh, um, and that's it. What has happened? I have created a new API gateway, and actually, that's now uh, made my Lambda, which is Chuck Norris, publicly available. 
to the internet. You can take your phone, you can try to hit it, and you probably will get an exception. And why you will get an exception? Yes, and uh, I will explain in a minute. So, um, don't worry, that's expected behavior. So, uh, when we expose Lambda with the API Gateway, this is the service that, uh, that has the CDN that attaches uh, to the Lambda uh, and it gives it a RESTful interface. So, um, but here is one challenge. So, um, the, the weakness of the Lambda architecture is that uh, when you create a Lambda, I want to make it as much usable as possible. But the reality is that uh, you need to write the code and actually try to guess who will call it, what will be the trigger, because every trigger brings the message in the different format. And what is more important, um, many of the lamb Lambda executions, actually you will have the, uh, you will generate the event and actually, and the next one um, who you will trigger, they expect message also in some kind of format. So you need, when you write the code, you need to actually take the payload, you need to guess uh, who was your caller, um, then dec in decrypt payload in the format of this caller, and then you can do something. And in my case, um, I, I successfully received message, but um, when I try to create a response, I created a response in the way as API Gateway did not understood. That's kind of sad. And uh, what I need to do is actually, I need to um, tell to the API gateway back that, oh, that was actually, a th uh, thank you, dear API gateway. Uh, it's uh, the result, uh, I've done my work and actually it, it was correct. So I need to say that, okay, the, um, the code will be uh, 200, which, which just means HTTP code will be 200, which means okay, and then, and so on. So, um, for for the convenience, I already created a method that will look approximately like that. So, first of all, um, I uh, first of all, and uh, in order to guess who is calling you, uh, I would suggest to use uh, uh, JSON schemas to validate the messages. Uh, to validate incoming payloads. This is how when you uh, you can create enough JSON schemas for uh, API gateway, for auto scaling groups, and for anybody who who is supposed to call you. And then actually you validate it like we did uh, ten years ago with the Java, right? Uh, at that time there was XML, but now it's uh, JSON schemas, right? And and then what I will do, I will produce the result that will look in the different format. In the previous format, I was, it was okay for me to just to give back any format and I gave the most simplistic JSON I can imagine. It's a string. Now I will give um, uh, an object that will have a certain structure. I will give result code. I, can gi I will give number of headers. And actually, that's important one uh, if you if you need to support cross origin requests for uh, to support Ajax calls. So uh, you need actually here to report all these course uh, headers, and and then the body. The body, uh, that's the funniest part. You, uh, if you want to return, uh, the body is actually a string. So if you want to return JSON, you must encode it you must serialize it into the string. That's the, uh, that's the um, Easter egg uh, from the Amazon. So, and then what you do, you just, uh, what I will do, because I already wrote this method, um, the, yeah, I will just uh, change the mapper of this method. I will save it. I will test that it produces uh, the results I want. And you see, and we see that it now starts to produce not the string, but it produces uh, an object. And this object exactly will be understood by my API gateway. If I hit this link, and voila, my browser actually, yeah, 
it's understood. And now it's, uh, now it's the string because this message has been uh, caught by API Gateway, decoded, and extracted the body string, and then converted to the JSON, and then uh, return it to the user. Uh, um, I would like to say hi to the designers of API of the Amazon. So, coming back. Um, what for do we use Lambda? So, first of all, this, with the API gateway, we use it for Ajax calls, primarily. We want to do get, read, uh, create, read, update, delete uh, queries to the data. And the, qu and the, the Lambda, because uh, it cannot confirm the le its latency, you should design it for asynchronous calls only. So, Ajax is pretty much fine. So, uh, then uh, you can inject sec some security to that. Uh, it's, uh, there is a resource called uh, Custom Authorizer that can say, yes, you shall pass or you shall not pass. And then this Custom Authorizer will be, um, it's actually another Lambda function that will, that will be executed, uh, that will check, uh, check the, info, uh, the cookie or, or the to or identity token uh, with the IDP that validate if it's fine, then it will pass, uh, it will pass to, to the real Lambda for execution. So, what are the challenges uh, between I was told, uh, I was telling you. So, first one is the um, challenge of the first execution latency. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, actually a thing that you need to consider before you do any design. And I repeat it again and again. So you cannot do remote debug. You can, uh, if something goes wrong, there is, besides the um, system out, you cannot understand what's happening and why it's happening. And uh, primarily this is because uh, you have new integration that's starting to send you a new format of the messages that you never expected before. So you need somehow, uh, learn, uh, when you write the code, learn how to react on this. So uh, what I would suggest is actually to rely on the unit test and, uh, and uh, write as, much, as many unit tests as you can. Uh, the only problem that when uh, you will need to, you will try to you will need to mock the other Amazon resources that will be additional challenge for that but please do otherwise it will be a um, problem and then again and again and again uh, they can send you anything yeah so uh, because you never know who is calling you y you can guess by using JSON schema um, and um, and then uh, from the message format, you, ca you can only make sure that they will send you JSON. So, uh, API Gateway challenges. So, there are a number of integrations with the API Gateway and Lambda, but please, please, please use only one called uh, Lambda Proxy. This, uh, uh, this integration is actually uh, gives you maximum control. You, you put this in the code, and then, uh, and then uh, you will have less uh, surprises. Um, yes, and now uh, I will quickly go into the uh, some blueprints of the Lambda functions. So, uh, I told you uh, Lambda is the stateless. Um, now we can make it stateful. We need uh, to do this, we need a database. What I would do is the following. I would um, uh, take the API gateway, because I will uh, put, make some database Ajax calls probably. Um, I will put the Lambda and I will inject uh, the um, database uh, connection information as the environment variables to the Lambda. By the way, that was update done only recently. Two years we were living without, uh, almost two years we were living uh, without um, environment variables for Lambda and that was pain. Now it's uh, with environment variables you can almost use Lambda as is. Uh, then uh, you will need to connect it to the VPC. For that, it will create a new uh, virtual uh, network interface that will uh, be attached to the VPC. And, and, this, and after that, you should be able to connect to the database inside of the VPC. And that's fine. And, the, uh, and then it can use it. Um, or if you want to go completely uh, serverless, you can uh, switch it to the DynamiceDB. The only one problem that I've always seen that then you need to put some back pressure 
because uh, the dynamic DB you paid for number of shards. And if you go uncontrollable with the number of sh uh, sh uh, because uh, Ajax can pull a lot of requests uh, and then you will uh, end up of creating a lot of shards for DynamiDB and actually uh, we, we can see that DynamiDB is the most expensive resource uh, in all your serverless infrastructure. Right? It's, um, if, you do it, if you do it wrong, uh, DynamiDB is super expensive. Step functions. Uh, this is uh, another one, rather new service um, that uh, serves to solve the problem when you need to um, uh, call after lambda function, you need to make uh, maybe a decision what to do next. You're not sure. Then, uh, uh, then you might call one lambda function or depends on the result, you might call another lambda function or call another service or maybe emulate, uh, emulate the error because the result says that, oh, this is error, and you must do something else, right? Um, there is only one uh, more or less normal way how to do it, is actually uh, through the step functions. But there is one limitation, that input for the lambda function will be output of the previous one, without any encoding anything, right? So uh, this is how uh, you basically uh, need to guess that you have been from the lambda function that you have been called not from API gateway that requires specific response. You need to um, you need to uh, guess that uh, you has been executed uh, uh, from the uh, step function. So uh, this is how uh, this is how you can get you can see the normal um, serverless website implemented. So you have the DNS name that is connected to the CDN cloud front. And uh, you have S3 bucket, uh, which is highly available storage. And that's enough uh, for the all static resources. For dynamic resources like a database, you go with the Amazon Lambda, uh, with the Ajax calls. So the first, what you do, you do the get document, you get the HTML, and then with the JavaScript, you make uh, calls for, for the data. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much, uh, pretty much it. Uh, super, uh, this actually design is uh, super cheap, less than one dollar to operate. Um, another one thing, the hipster portal, that's my favorite one. So uh, what's the, I will show you how to host the corporate uh, portal with less than five dollars a month to host it. Scalable, highly available, and uh, other illities that you can, uh, you can imagine. So, uh, the uh, if you read the thought works, it says that what uh, you can use Git as the CMS, because Git has everything what you need for, for the CMS. You, it, it, it has the document control, it has the version history, and so on, and so you can branch the documents. And um, this is why we can pair uh, Amazon Lambda with the code commit. And the code commit is the hosted Git server that uh, costs you only one dollar. And it's highly available. There's only one problem with it. It is only hosted in US region, as we speak. But over the time, it, will, it probably will expand. There is one, another one, even a tiny problem. There is no Git client in the container for Lambda. You need to build it. And to do this, you, ne you need to practice some probably Go or C programming. So there is a libgit li uh, library that you need to statically link to your executables and, cre and create um, and create um, executable file that you deploy together with your Lambda function and then you call it uh, and then you call it. This is how uh, with a little bit uh, practice of statically linking the library, you should be able to you should be able to deliver a git client. And then it works fine. I've done it, uh, yeah, it was good. And this is how uh, the hipster portal look. So you have the editor who is uh, taking, uh, who is putting uh, the documents in, inside of the co uh, Git repository. Then it is uh, automatically, uh, it triggers the Lambda event that takes the, Lambda takes the document, creates a nicely looking HTML and puts in the super cheap S3 storage which uh, costs you five cents per gigabyte. 
um, it will uh, trigger the event that other lambda function will update uh, update the cache of the cloud front, which is CDN. And uh, yeah, this is how you can immediately get uh, uh, get uh, the HTML copy of the particle that has been pushed to the Git. Uh, and actually the bottom line, which is uh, for other data, something like comments and so on, you can easily get it from the database. Yeah, that's basically it. The last but not least uh, uh, from me is actually um, um, CICD. For this, you can use S3 as the backend. It's actually a modification of the previous, uh, uh, of the previous um, hipster portal. Uh, design with only one difference for testing purpose you might want to execute uh, uh, not only lambda but actually uh, you might execute the sleepy hello um, VMs that well you will spin up the VM it will run the execution it will run the whole test suite if it exceeds five minutes and then it will uh, as the last comment it will terminate itself and the result, uh, you can, uh, through the SNS, you can get back to the, um, uh, to the Slack or, or so on, uh, to, uh, through the Slack bot or so on, through the SNS reply that uh, the build was successful or not. Right. That's it. So, um, once again, optimize for what you use. Uh, split uh, deployment code into two parts, uh, initial and, and the incremental. Um, Lambda is actually the perfect use case, and uh, this is why we stopped using them because we wanted more frequent interaction and more and better user experience. Do not use it for a UI because of unpredictable maintenance. But it's perfect for rarely occasional events, something like message from the uh, chatbot, um, DevOps events, something like auto scaling group uh, trigger, and so on. That's the perfect something that uh, uh, you do not put a VM and uh, to listen for event that appears uh, twice a week. Use Lambda for that. And uh, yeah, basically um, that's repetition and uh, between the frameworks. We have looked at all major frameworks uh, to support Lambda, but and we stopped using them, all of them. Uh, there are two frameworks look more or less promising. It's a serverless, but it only works with Node.js. And Chalice, uh, it only works on the Python. Yeah, and uh, yeah, actually other competitors like Azure or Google, they are a little bit uh, behind. I would say they have uh, several, a lot to ca catch up basically. Why I only focus on Amazon because uh, uh, Amazon provides a whole family of the services where other needs to catch up. So, and if you need to know more about Lambda, uh, get this book. It's a very good book. It's recently, uh, it recently was published. And yeah, it's available. Yeah, that's it from me. And uh, do we have any, any time for questions? Any time for questions? Any time for questions? Any time for questions? Any time for questions?